Okay. With regards to the, um, the amount of um, percentage that you put on your first finger, what's that? So about 50%, is it? So this is a, not a simple answer. Okay. <laughs> the, <laughs> yeah. It's his archery. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> he asked about what is the, t uh, the pressure, the amount of pressure on each finger. It's going to differ for everybody. Everybody has different length fingers. Everybody has different individual lengths of each finger as, as well. Different jaw uh, slopes as well. That will always will also change the pressure. Also, different tillers will es essentially change how much pressure is on each individual finger as well, plus how much hook you have. Um, we have not, to my knowledge, as a sport, ever put pressure... Uh, sensing pads, whatever you want to call it, on your fingers and said, okay, when you're at full draw, pressure is distributed in this way. We haven't done that as far as I know, um, and it's really hard to tell because it's, you know, it's a subjective thing. So I can say, oh, I've got, and to, to me, in all honesty, I feel the most pressure at full draw on these two fingers and the least on this finger. If you think about it, it only makes sense because whereas the string is pushing most on this part and this part, up here and down here. This middle one, it's not like the string is making a triangle when you're at full draw. Because um, if it did, so if the string did this when you were at full draw, and this was your middle finger, your index finger, and your ring finger, yeah, I'd say the most pressure is on your middle finger. However, the string actually looks like this when you're at full draw with your middle, your index, and your ring finger. So the most pressure, in my opinion, is here and here on those two fingers. However, the way to address the pressure on the fingers is at inset position. So that means down here. Before I even pull the bow back, where and how much pressure am I putting on my fingers? And I can tell you, I'll draw it really quick, where my string sits on my fingers. So I've already got my fingers index right about here. Middle finger actually does this, and my ring finger is right about there. So I say not in on the joint. It unfortunately kind of crosses the joint of my fingers. My middle finger is a lot longer uh, than my ring finger. And, but because I'm hooking this way and up and in, it's not, there's not much pressure on the joint itself on my middle finger. Again, I believe that more pressure is on your index and ring at full draw. However, <clears throat> you should be focusing your pressure, especially on your index and middle finger right here. That's where your pressure should be on your index and middle finger at set position. Ring finger is kind of irrelevant. Um, but what I mean is the pressure needs to be on the bottom sides of your fingers. And you do that by hooking up. When you hook up, my finger is only, this part of my finger is touching the string. The top side is not even touching. And my finger tab doesn't even cover my whole index finger. It barely covers from the middle of my index finger down because the top part never really even touches the string. Um, so, in set position, I and Coach Lee and you know people that I've worked with, he basically just says 80 to 90 of the pressure on your index finger, 10 to 20 on your middle, and the remainder on your ring finger. Very little on the ring finger, because we are really focused on the index and middle finger in this position, and we're hooking upwards and I'm curling my index finger a whole lot compared to my other fingers. So when I'm at full draw, this is actually my hand position, and that's what I'm doing in set position, is already establishing the correct hand position down here before I pull back, and then it never changes all the way through the shot. Okay? So in set position, I hook up with a lot of index finger curl. And the whole idea to that is if I'm at full draw, and I curl my index finger more, I can feel more back tension. If I curl more, bo more bottom finger, I can feel more bicep tension. So more back tension, more bicep tension. So the whole idea is you want more back tension and it just seems like the index finger has like a direct relationship to your back. For whatever reason, the ring finger has more bicep. I'm sure Heather could say something specific to this, but I, I, I theorize because there's two main muscle groups that control these finger and these fingers separately, I bet you these go up higher and these go more where the bicep tendon attaches and that's why you feel more bicep tension if I had to guess. So at set position, 80 to 90, 10, 20 to 10 and the remainder here. Um, the whole idea, again, more index finger, more back tension. 
And then the upwards hook has to do with jaws, jaw angles. So my jaw slopes upwards like most people do. So in order for me to have full contact through here on my anchor, I have to move my hand upwards. And to facilitate that, you have more index finger curl, less bottom finger curl, and you're in this position like that. So not like this. That's more bicep, no anchor. And then this way you can anchor, because like, like that, as opposed to like that. You can't anchor. I mean, you can anchor, but it's not a real anchor. Is that, does that help a bit? Okay. Good? All right. And like I said, if we're moving forward, people remember random things about form stuff, happy to come back to it. Um, I was going to kind of, we're about an hour in, we got an hour and a half left, so I figured we'd kind of move on to some tuning stuff or equipment related stuff if you guys would like. Yeah? And if we want to take a five minute break for the bathroom, or well, probably 15 minute because there's very small amounts of bathrooms, it's up to you guys, we can do that too. Um, but anyway, so tuning stuff, again, like I said, at the training center I had access to all these experts in the field, the people who actually designed the products, and then eventually I start, started to be able to help innovate and design my own products um, through various companies as well. And um, it was something that it, it always excited me. I'm a mechanical type of person. I like to put my hands on things. I grew up, my dad built race cars um, since the 70s, so ever since I could remember, I was in the shop messing around with equipment and crushing cars in the press and, you know, matchbox. Anyway, messing around with stuff. So it was exciting to me, and I ended up just falling into it and, and loving it. Um, so, in my opinion, do we have another, um, well, yeah, we'll put another face up. something that was extremely important was doing everything in the correct order. You have to do it in the correct order. If not, you're going to chase your tail. So for example, if you don't have your center shot set correctly and you go to do a bear shaft tune, um, your bear shaft tune or your, your stiff weak selection will be affected by your center shot. If your center shot's off a little bit, it affects your, your tune directly, the, the actual stiffness of the arrow or, or what it's telling you. And not only that, if your limbs aren't aligned, then your center shot's not correct, and then your tune's not correct. So you can see it just exponentially grows as far as confusion, and you're having to fight yourself and recorrect things that you could have corrected in the beginning if you choose chose to do it in the correct order. Make sense? Simple theory? Okay. So generally, there's some basic stuff like bow weight, tiller, brace height, that type of thing. You guys already know, well, when I say bow, bow weight, I set my rough bow weight, I already know that I want to shoot somewhere around 46 pounds. If I take my bow, brand new bow out of the box, or a new set of arrows, or whatever, or a new plunger, my bow is around 46 pounds-ish, at least it was in the last year that I shot. And so I'd rough set my bow to 46 pounds, I'd set my tiller within the acceptable range that the manufacturer recommends, and set my tiller, I, I mean, I'd set it at 3 30 seconds of an inch split because that's what I knew I always liked. However, the range, standard range is an eighth to a quarter shorter on the bottom and just throw it together. So I say, you know, your basic rough setup is first. Um, again, it's going to be relevant to what you guys have to, to say about it. But then it's definitely limb alignment next. Um, and then you go basically into more rough stuff. So you eyeball your center shot. And eyeball the center shot, I can tell you for sure, without a doubt, at least in my experience and every experience that I've had hands-on with other people, uh, parallel shaft arrows down the center of the string, X10s and ACEs out to the left, a smidge, just a smidge. The reason is, um, is an X10 and an ACE are, whoops, are barreled. So when your bow is at brace height here, you're at the center of the, the plunger is towards the center of the arrow. So that's in this area, right? The arrow's fatter in the middle than it is on the end when you're at full draw. 
So when you're at full draw, if your bear shaft is looking like, I mean, your, your arrow is looking like this with it fatter in the middle at brace height, as you pull back, it does this and it straightens out because the arrow is thinner towards the point. So that's the whole reason as to why you set your center shot outside of center with barreled shafts is because it's fatter where your brace, where your um, plunger is contacting it at brace height. Okay? So um, it's verified by a walk back tune. But anyway, so I set your rough center shot, rough, and then you move into a rough tune. Well, you set your knocking point and all that stuff, but that's all kind of nuanced stuff that you guys should know by now. Um, so your rough bear shaft, what, is, what does rough bear shaft mean to me? If I can shoot six arrows, three fletch, three bear, and they all land within the gold of a uh, 80 centimeter face at 30 meters, that's my rough bear shaft tune. That's good enough. Not everybody can shoot six arrows and the gold at 30 meters on an 80 centimeter face, so you kind of got to tune it down or up depending on where you're comfortable. Um, by the end of the process that I'm going to show you in the order of operations, I knew where I wanted my bear shaft to be, or I knew where my bear shaft often ended up after my fine tuning was done once I get to the end of this. So my rough bear shaft tune, I wouldn't just say six arrows in the gold, I would put my bear shafts in, the, in a very specific place and start from there because I had less fine tuning to do from that point forward. So once you get your rough bear shaft tune, at the same time you can start playing with your stabilizers setup. Um, this is kind of a, an insertable thing as you go along, so you can do it in this point. You can also do it after you do uh, your, your final bear shaft tune because maybe your bow weight has to change a whole lot. So if your bow weight's changing a whole lot, chances are your balance of what you want your bow to be is going to be different. And I can tell you firsthand experience, as you change your stabilizers, your tune changes. So if you buy a new set of stabilizers, I guarantee your tune's changing. If you go from 10 inch V-bars and a 6 inch extension to 3 inch extension and 16 inch V-bars, your tune's going to be way different. But for me, it was way different. Maybe not other people, but I noticed for a rule of thumb, sidetrack note, the more weight I had on the back, the longer my V-bars were, the weaker and the weaker the arrow became and the higher knocking point I needed to have the same bear shaft tune. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. It just somehow broke down the spine of the arrow more and it needed a higher knocking point. So just that's why this can kind of be inserted as needed. <coughs> if you're not changing your bow weight a whole lot, and therefore you're not stabilizers a whole lot, then you're not really changing your tune a whole lot. So set your stabilizers up. We can talk about that in a second more. Um, so and then after stabilizers, generally I tend to go into the the um, the walk back tune. I'm going to show you the order of operations first, and then I'll tell you how I do each. Then I will, uh, after the walk back, and again, there's, there's these three are kind of going to be interchangeable. I set my uh, brace height. Then I do my final uh, bear shaft. Then I will do fine tuning. So, what I mean by these steps, walk back tune, has anybody done one here? Yeah. yeah. Does everybody know what a walk back tune is or how to do it? Super simple. Um, make sure that the, the best thing that I can say about uh, the walk back tune is absolutely do not move your sight while you're going back and absolutely make sure that the vertical reference line that you have is as perfectly vertical to gravity as possible. I had it um, because I was used to shooting field archery. My target was sitting down at 70 meters like this, like not even remotely close to being square or straight. I didn't care. It's a target. It's a round target face. It doesn't matter. So what I did was I drew a dot that I knew I could see at 50 meters, and I took a four-foot um, carpentry, carpentry uh, level, and I would just go from the center of the dot 
level this and draw a line with my Sharpie on the back side of a target face. And that was how I set up my, my walk back tune. So you gotta make sure that line's perfectly vertical, otherwise you'll get a false reading. Um, <clears throat> and then I set my brace height. So the way I set my brace height is definitely different than, you know, most people will just play with it. Oh, the bow sounds fine, whatever, leave it. It's within the range, doesn't matter. But the way I like to set my brace height is I will set it to the minimum recommended brace height that the manufacturer for the limbs recommend, not the riser, with the exception of the, uh, the HP geometry of the Hoyts and, uh, because they're, the, they're 700 thousandths of an inch less deflex. So when they say you need a shorter brace height, you absolutely need a shorter brace height because you would not shoot a 10 and a quarter inch brace height on a 72 inch bow, a normal ILF, right? So why would you shoot and eight and three quarter inch brace height on the HP geometry because you're literally just cranking the limbs back too much. Um, anyway, so I set it to the minimum brace height of the limbs and then I will shoot an arrow or two at blank bail, add two or three twists to the string, shoot another arrow or two at blank bail, add two or three twists to the string and again, continue that path all the way until I hit the maximum uh, brace height that's recommended by the limbs and I find Generally, I would say nine times out of ten, there are two spots within that range that feel good. There's a shorter one and a higher one. The shorter one feels very punchy, so that means that it pops. Right when the, when the shot breaks and I let it go, I, it's a definitive pop. And I can feel the bow jump really hard out of my hands. But then afterwards, I can feel the limbs vibrating, the bow shaking, and doing stuff that most of your shooters would not like. However, the second brace height is a softer delivery of the arrow and then there's almost no residual vibration after the shot. But to me, I would rather have the aggressive, crisp pop that the arrow gets delivered out of the bow in a, in a, in a quick manner um, with a punch. It just, for me, I prefer that. And uh, yeah, the bow ends up being a, tid, you know, a little bit louder. However, um, a shorter brace height, you get more speed it breaks down the spine less. So I ended up gaining speed a little bit being within that shorter brace height as well. And then you do your final bear shaft tune. You do that there because the walk back tune, which is your center shot, affects the tune and the brace height definitely affects your tune. And then I go into fine tuning. So my fine tuning is super simple. It's easiest at 70 meters. It's one of my favorite tunings to do because it does not in any way affect the actual training day at all and it's nothing but free points as far as I'm concerned. So I would shoot anywhere between 10 and 15 arrows an end. I definitely leaned towards around 12 is optimal. And I'd have a group and you know, you can just have a group impact, something like this. And then I will take and basically you can start right to left or up to down. It doesn't matter which way. This group's wider than it is tall. So I go down to the target and I disregard the furthest left and the furthest right arrow. Maybe the wind blew, maybe I made a mistake, whatever. I just like to discard the, fly, the two flyers just in case. So that's why I'm shooting 10, 12 arrow ends or so. And then I'll measure the furthest spread from the furthest left arrow to the furthest right arrow. And we'll say it's you know this long. And actually I, I just take my arrow and I don't even use a pen on the, the weird rubbery plastic targets and I just make a score line on the target with my arrow point and I measure with my arrow because it's much easier and quicker to just see what I'm doing. So I actually draw a visual representation on the target up high. I shoot another end, I do the same thing and uh, you know maybe this one my, my group's a little bit wider than the other but it's still fairly consistent. You know it's not that far apart. It's not like one group was this wide and the next group was this wide. Then if that was happening chances are I got to work on my form and I'd spend you know get more dividends by spending time on my form than my tuning. But if it's consistent, I'll make an adjustment. Left to right, I just add three clicks to my clicker or my plunger. Just in any direction, in or out, doesn't matter. Add three clicks, remove three clicks. Shoot another end. I actually always shoot two ends unless I see a dramatic change where then my next end the arrows the, you know are much wider spread than what they were previously. So eventually you can narrow it down, 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 down and end up with a tighter group. And you end up, you will find a bell-shaped curve 
kind of. So you'll see a lot of dramatic increase in performance as you start your initial movements, but then as you start getting closer and closer to optimal, you'll see less gains. And if you eventually keep going, you'll end up seeing negative returns. So once you start seeing it plateau, stop and do the other thing. Do the other method. Go up or down if you were doing left and right or vice versa. <coughs> I always preferred the uh, Shiboya rest because it was so easy to use and so easy to move um, for my vertical tuning. And I can tell you for sure, without a doubt, I have shot 14 arrow ends, so 12 arrows. The group size, both left to right and up and down, went from just about the size of the gold to smaller than the size of the ten ring. And if you can do that when you're not having the best day on earth, when you're just not shooting the best, you don't feel as good, you're just something's not right, maybe you slept funny or whatever. If you can get your bow to group like that when you're off, imagine how good it can be when you're on. So I always suggest to do this type of fine tuning if you can when you're having an off day. Because if you can, you're tuning in forgiveness into the bow, in theory. At least that's how I perceived it to be. So, again, fine-tuning uh, fine happens at the end. That's what this is. From After you get past this step, sometimes, like with a Hoyt, the old ones, this, this could take three hours to this point, and then this would take maybe an hour and a half. This takes days, two, three days, in my experience. But again, it doesn't affect your training plan at all. What distance you do you find tuning at? At the distance I'm scoring at. So I'll do it at 70 meters for outdoors and then indoors. It's a lot more difficult, especially when you're shooting big arrows that I generally prefer to because it just tears the target up. So it gets expensive, but every 30 arrows I'll swap the target faces out. And then what I do is I take the target face and I flip it over. So I'm not looking at the actual face, I'm just looking at the impact points. And I take a micrometer and I measure left to right, up to down. And I'll mess with my my settings and see if I can get it any better. So. How, how many button turns are you doing that fine tuning over? What sort of range? So. so to be honest, every time my fine tuning ended, and I'll tell you with a biter plunger because generally everybody uses one, on a medium spring I would find that my groups would be best somewhere in the range from 5.0 to 6.0 on a, on a medium spring. So it ended up being right around five, 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 seven. Usually is where it kind of ended up for whatever reason. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'll generally to go from start to finish, I'll have at the most a turn and a half change on my plunger. But it makes a big difference. And and when you're doing stuff like this and you draw a line, so I I would take an arrow and I would just go like this, left to right, grab it. And then I take and I'd hold it like this. I'd make my score, and then I would say okay, and then score it there, and then that's my width. And you could see as I would shoot, it would go down or go up. And if it, once it went up, I like oh, went too far or um, moved it the wrong way. At what uh, what spring pressure would you start that? I I just grabbed a medium spring at five five. Mm -hmm. What I always did. So five five means. Um, the so on the biter plunger it has all these hash marks yeah. and at one it has a number five in the middle yeah. and then around the barrel there's the numbers mm -hmm. so yeah. right at five this would be 5.0 and I call this direction 5.5 and then six seven eight nine and then this would be four three two that's what I call mm -hmm. that so I was always in past just about the five mark with the medium spring. Never went, never shot the heavy spring. Um, indoors, I may go down to a light spring potentially, um, but generally, I would just shoot a lighter, lighter spring indoors uh, or a lighter tension indoors was optimal. So, so now fine tuning really quick. Where I would end up for me, and I think it's different for everybody. My Flat shafts, if they were landing here at 30 meters, my bare shafts, optimally, that I found after my fine tuning was done, I always saw a pattern of my bare shafts landing somewhere in there. And this is actual distance at 30 meters. So about two inches weak and two to three inches high. That's just where my bare shafts landed 
when I was done with fine tuning. So when I set my rough bare shaft tune, this is what I went for with my bare shaft when I was rough tuning. And when I definitely set my final bare shaft after this, I'd set it here because then instead of this taking three days, it then took only one day. It, you know, it still took 300 arrows. So, you know, I tend to do the fine tuning on my heaviest training days because I know it's going to be a long day. Um, there's always questions about plungers. <coughs> always questions about plungers. <coughs> The best advice I can advise on plungers, well, there's two, um, and I, I kind of want to show you guys something interesting, too. But from what um, Don Rabska, who was a good shooter around the um, Daryl Pace, Rick McKinney, um, and, and those guys, was on the original design team of the X-10, and he said that the X-10 typically, and, and I don't know about the other ones because I, I just haven't done this, but he said typically compared to like an ACC and compared to a aluminum arrow for sure, the X10, the amplitude of the Archer's Paradox does not change, but the frequency that it oscillates goes way up. The X10 has a much higher frequency of oscillation than an aluminum arrow. That's what he told me. Um, he had data to show it, but I couldn't. I, it was beyond my comprehension. And uh, so he said that he found forgiveness went up when you had a stiffer plunger tension for an X10 than an X7. So um, food for thought. So because I, you know, I was around the 5.5, five, 6 mark with a medium spring. He said, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much right where I would shoot it um, or where I would recommend it with an X10. Again, I don't know. Carbon Express or whatever. I don't. I don't know where to put it for that. Um, but that's basically the best thing that I can say. And while doing your doing your fine tuning, it's going to tell you where you're optimal based on these factors. Based on where your stabilizers are. Again, it affects tune, your brace height, your center shot, um, and all those factors. You gotta. If it's shooting the best on its own, then it's got to be good. In my opinion. Yep. You said there that you deliberately try to get your bear shaft to go slightly high and slightly right. Yeah. If you were to tune your bow that the bear shaft was in with the flat shafts, how much wider did your group become? Um, if I were to just... So at my final bear shaft, if I would set this to be in there, yes. I would say a 12 arrow group at 70 meters would be right about the size of the yellow, on average, give or take, uh, whatever day. Yeah. But if I did my fine tuning, which generally ended up in this yeah. tune for me, I'm not saying it should be for you, that's going to take time for you to find in years of fine tuning different setups, it went from 9 to about the 10 ring. So 50% better. I'd, I'd say 50% better, which is massive. Yeah. You know? Because a lot of archers get caught up on I have to have a bear shaft in with my flex arrows. No, I can tell you that most Koreans, according to what Coach Lee tells me, and I do believe him, is most Koreans will put their bear shafts five to six inches straight high. Because they want the arrow to have a direction, a consistent direction, every single time it comes out of the bow. Their theory was, if they're making mistakes, at least the arrow is wanting to go the same direction every single time, so the flight path should be the same and the impact point should be the same. And you can see it. If you stand back and you watch them shoot, you'll see their arrows like phew, take off like a plane and they whip up and then they come down. Um, so, and I've heard that several times from many people. They they would say, "Oh yeah, this is kind of where the optimal wants to be," but I put direction on it on purpose. And most of the times when I hear that, hear people say they put direction on purpose, they always tell me they put their bear shaft high. So I don't know who originated that or where it came from, but I have noticed that as well. Take that with whatever you'd like to, to yeah. have that. You mentioned uh, your fine tuning at distance. Uh, you switched from your side to side group to your up and down, and you touched on uh, moving the Shibuya rest mm -hmm. up and down. Yeah. I've never experienced this. Can you just talk a uh, moving it up and down? down? Yeah. So literally, it would be if this is your uh, the, the plunger tip. So if your if your plunger in the bow is facing you like this. And your arrow is, uh, say, sitting right here. Yeah. This is the, the where the arrow is contacting the plunger. I would literally just take, loosen up my rest and bump it down to the arrow would be sitting down here. Shoot an end. If the group's got better, great. Move it down some more. And once I got to about here, 
like the last 25% of the plunger, I would measure my brace height, I mean my knocking point, mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. the rest, not from the plunger, but from the rest, <coughs> you know, the, where the, the, the thing is just touching your rest, the square, mm -hmm. measure my brace height, and then take my rest and move it up to where my arrow is now sitting up here, and then cut off my knocking points and retie my knocking points to where it was when it was here. Does that make sense? So if it was a quarter inch high down here, right, if the, if the knocking point was a quarter inch up here, I would move the front of the arrow up to the top of the plunger and then move my knocking point up until I was again a quarter inch high again and then continue my, my tuning. So uh, very, you, you can, you can, also do it with your tiller. Yeah. Um, I find though, so notice I didn't say put your tiller anywhere. This is kind of, it's up to each individual person. For me, I found that my tiller really affected the way I felt finger pressure, the pressure on my fingers. And I found if I had more, like if I had more towards a quarter inch of pressure, I had so much bottom finger tension. For whatever reason, I just had a hard time keeping my bottom finger on the string. So I found with what you know, I write like just under an eighth of an inch or right at an eighth of an inch, it felt best to me. Most traditional recurve setup gurus, especially the Koreans, mess with their tiller to help them hold steady as they're pulling back. Again, because they're aiming before they're pulling back, and the way they set their stabilizers up is six inch extension, 10 inch V bars, uh, about four ounces on the long rod, and an ounce and a half on each V bar, period. End of story. You never touch it, never adjust it. That's what the Korean setup is. Oh, and also a top weight. So they never adjust their stabilizers to help them hold still where I do. And I, I, I can, that's where I'm heading next. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, any more questions? With the bracing height, you said about the high and the low. Yeah. Would the low not be as forgiving as the higher brace height for the average archer? Because um, it would make the arrow stiffer, would it not? Yeah, it makes the arrow stiffer, but then I change my tune to make it not stiff anymore. <coughs> So I go up in bow weight to compensate for that too, being not stiff. So then, being more aggressive wouldn't necessarily make it a bit more <clears throat> twitchy. Maybe. Um, I, so this is where the argument comes in of what's better indoors, an X10 or an aluminum arrow? You know, aluminum mm -hmm. arrows are heavier, slower, they're on the bow longer, so more chances for you to make a mistake, right? However, the lighter arrow is faster, it's out of the bow faster, but if you're making a mistake, it's lighter less inertia, resistance, so when you make a mistake, it's gonna move more because it's lighter. It's like six of one, half a dozen of the other, so it's, um, in my experience, I've not seen a massive loss from going with the longer, or the lower brace height, but again, I, I don't know anybody that spent 45 minutes to an hour and a half messing with their brace height in front of a blank veil just for the sake of how it feels, so. Kind of over analytical than that type of stuff. So I don't know. I don't have an exact answer for that. Um, you know, for me, and we're, we'll talk about this a little bit in the mental stuff. But for me, it ultimately comes down to what makes the shooter feel better, or more confident, more happy with their setup. If if they're confident and happy about it, they're going to have a better mental game going into the tournament than if they're not feeling good about it. So if it makes them feel good to find the optimal brace height the way I suggest it, that could be an advantage over the potential negating effects of the lead, less forgiving setup because, yeah, there's an argument, a longer a bow is, the higher your brace height is, the more forgiving it can be. And, you know, I, I see that to be generally true, but from what side? It's difficult to say because if you think about it, in my opinion, if you had a long set of limbs versus short set of limbs, the short set of limbs, there's less flexing material, less, and especially some of the stuff that we do use is wood, which is a natural material. And as the temperature changes up and down, that's going to affect that flexing part, the part that actually delivers the arrow less because there's less material of it. So in my argument is from an engineering standpoint, a shorter limb is more forgiving than a longer limb. But that's purely from engineering and not from first-hand shooter experience. So that's why when I shot the Hoyts, I shot long to 27 inch riser and short limbs. Um, and then I also added, uh, I had limbs custom built with the long wedge in the limbs. So there's a, 
the wedge is this point in the limb, you can see it go fat to taper down to thin. And so a short limb has a shorter wedge, a longer limb has a longer wedge. And so I had Hoyt build me short limbs with a long wedge in it. So the limb didn't flex till, instead of the wedge ending here, the wedge ended way out here. So actually a lot less of the limb was flexing. Uh, and I liked it and it shot well. But again, that was just me being crazy about engineering analytical stuff. So it's up to the person, I think. Sorry, I can't answer that question. Uh, okay, so stabilizer setup. Um, there's always a lot of questions about that too. It's gonna be up to each individual person. You know, I, again, I already talked about the whole aiming thing. You aim after you transfer. You don't aim before you pull back. So who cares what your tiller is doing while you're pulling the bow back? You can use your brace, your, your stabilizers to hold your bow still. And it's a simple formula. If this is your uh, sight, or this is your target, and this is my sight pin, and I'm aiming in the middle, and I'm trying to execute the shot, and then all of a sudden my sight pin is like drooping, and I have to force it back up, and it just keeps wanting to go down. Or you have something that compound shooters like to call a dip bang. They're at full draw, they're pulling, 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 and it goes dip bang, and they shoot a low nine or whatever. That's because you have too much weight on your long rod or not enough weight on your V-bars. It's a simple balance equation. If I'm aiming, 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 and it's pulling me down, I have too much weight up front or not enough in the back. So it's a very simple equation. You can change your weights around simply by monitoring how your sight picture is. And the same thing goes for left and right. If I'm aiming and it's drifting to the right, well, I'll take one weight off the right rod and put it on the left rod. And chances are that's too much for me, so I end up taking my double adjustable V-bar bracket and click the right one in one click. And that usually solves this type of uh, aiming pattern. So typical Korean style, old school setup with stabilizers is they grab their bow and they go, yep, that's good because they have a top weight and they have a long stabilizer and the weights end up sitting about here because they use a six inch extension and this is what they want because they want the bow to, to rock forward after the shot happens. And again, to me, what, who cares what the bow does after the arrow's gone? I care about the bow helping me aim more while I'm trying to shoot, not what the reaction is after the shot. So that's something that I still just don't understand. Um, but uh, there is also a, a caveat to say about this. Some people, not necessarily recurve shooters, but compound shooters will set their bow up to have a direction on purpose. So they have to constantly resist it all the time. I don't like that idea. They say it, they can hold more still that way, but I, I'd rather have the bow work with me to help hold the, uh, the sight pin in the middle. So again, the stabilizers, kind of can be set somewhere in this range uh, because if you're really drastically changing your stabilizer setup, you're really going to drastically change your, not drastically, but you're going to change your, <coughs> your bear shaft too, okay? Also, food for thought on the rubber dampers or doinkers or whatever you want to call them on the uh, stabilizer in between the weights and the rod. So, old school stabilizer tech is really soft rod and uh, you know the, the doinker with the weights on the end of it. So the way that the weights on the end of a stabilizer actually hold the bow still in space. So say if I, if I take this bow, it's resting at brace height, but at, and at full draw, if I pull it back without torquing it, I'm not influencing the bow. But if I induce torque, it's now changing the way the bow is acting at, at full draw. So if I'm adding torque this direction, when I let go, what do you think it's going to want to do? It's going to want to snap back this direction while it's delivering the arrow. So the whole idea to the stabilizing system, doing it modern with the weights directly on a high modulus carbon stiff stabilizer, is when you're at full draw, if you accidentally torque the bow and you let it go, the stabilizers clamp the bow down in space and allow the arrow to be delivered and then the bow snaps back into position. So for compound, they found mass, massive uh, gains to their scores when they started doing that, both for their aiming pattern and for that clamping down in space thing, especially because they can um, change their, uh, they can do torque tuning with like the freak show rest and stuff.
but for us recurve shooters, we can't really do that. However, <coughs> when you add the rubber weights between the rubber dampers between the weights and the rods, the stabilizing system does not influence the bow un until the weight is fully loaded in one direction and then wants to come back. So is there a stabilizer handy anywhere with a doinker on it? It doesn't have to have too much. Just so I can show you. If not, anyway, um, while they're getting it. So the, yeah, perfect. <coughs> <laughs> so, so you've got the weight and the damper, and there is a disconnect from the weight to the stabilizer. Yeah, we can all agree there's a disconnect. So when you watch it on high speed, this is happening as the bow is flying around as you're shooting. <clears throat> the moment that this weight actually does anything to help hold the bow still, well, the stabilizer still, and it's connected to the bow, so the bow, is when this weight stops moving in space after it hits maximum, like its maximum cycle this one direction, and then the bow can free float again until this weight stops in space and then resists the movement. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. It takes <clears throat> about a sixth of a second for this movement to happen from side to side, and it takes about a sixtieth of a second for the arrow to leave the bow. So therefore, the stabilizers are doing nothing when it's doing like this because the arrow's long gone. So again, that whole torque thing. So just theory. This is, again, uh, more theory on, on stabilizers. Does that kind of make sense? So for me, what I did, yes, the rubber doinkers make a massive difference the way the bow feels. It sounds better, feels happier, less vibration. So what I would play with, if I had eight ounces on this end, I'd maybe put four against the bar directly and four outside on the doinker, or maybe just one. Uh, or change the stiffness of this and, and affect the way the bow feels. And it was one of my favorite things to play with, again, because it didn't affect my training day really at all other than, I, other than time of screwing and unscrewing weights and, and things like that. So it was always something fun for me to play with. Um, yeah? If the arrow's already gone, why does that matter or not matter, please? Uh, so again, the this bow... This is 60 of a second for it to do this, but the arrow's gone. Yeah. Is, this, is that rubber and the weight for the arch or for the arrow? Uh, the rubber and the weight is only affecting the feel of the bow after the arrow is gone. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, you know. And the, 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 the dynamical, where you put the weights is to make it stay on the pin. Yes. To stay on the goal. Yes, right, okay. yes. But then you can adjust where you put this within the weights. Yeah. Because, you know, I would end up running anywhere from six to 12 ounces on the long rod. So I had a, a large amount of weights that I could adjust in the front or behind of, of the, the damper itself. So I always like to put some on the rod. Um, and then, you know, advanced stuff is, so when, they, when Compound started using this, that theory of putting the weights directly on the rod and using the the stabilizers to help their sight picture. Their aiming pattern went from this to this, and their groups went from this to this. With recurve, our aiming pattern went from this to this, but our groups went from this to this. It didn't really, there was no direct correlation. So I, I know, um, now that I've done a whole lot of playing with it, that there is, there's a reason for that. And it's, in my opinion, I don't know, I haven't proven it yet, but my theory is it's because we don't have a wall to pull against, we don't have a stop to pull against. So when you're shaking, not only is your draw length changing, but your limb tips are curling and uncurling independent and differently of each other. So you might be releasing on this one versus this mm -hmm. one, and so you're gonna have different impact points. And by using the weight directly on the thing, the rod theory, it's clamping the bow down in space, so it's clamping it down, delivering it this <coughs> way compared to this way. So your groups are bigger despite the better aiming pattern. I found that to all be in the extension, 100%. Um, and I found that to be the most important, critical piece of the entire stabilization system. And uh, I developed a, an extension with AAE. I don't know if you guys have one of the ones here. I have one to show you guys. Uh, but there is a, uh, there's a damper in the middle of the extension that allows the stabilizers to move slightly independent of the bow, but in a controlled manner not in a completely floppy manner. Um, 
So it's adjustable, it's two pieces, and there's a, a cone on this side and the reverse on this side, and a bushing you put in the center. This is, this is a Delrin one, so it's made of hard plastic, and then there's a urethane one that can go on there too. And you can also adjust the preload or the tension in the actual extension, and there, it's indicated and marked in graduations on this. Um, so you can adjust the tension of it, and then you can lock it down so it doesn't spin independent of each other with a, a lock screw inside of here, and then put your extension in, uh, or your V-bar bracket and stuff on. And anyway, uh, I found this to be a massive increase in the answer between why did our aiming pattern go from this to this, but our groups did this. Um, and my groups tightened up a whole lot with this because it allows the, the limbs to kind of recenter a little bit and then deliver the arrow as opposed to just flopping all over the place. Because my theory was old school stabilizing tech, if you're here one shot, if this is optimal, if you're here one shot or here the next shot, if you're not controlling the bow at all with the stabilizing system, if you're here that one shot, as the arrow is being delivered, it wants to go back to this position because that's where the bow is naturally. But I believe that it goes like this and then it delivers the arrow. So it's changing it and throwing everything off. And then the other with the weights directly on the rod, it does this compared to this each shot. So that's not ideal. So you want it to be controlled and let the arrow go at an optimal spot or in a controlled manner. Anyway, this is, you guys can pass this around and play with it if you want. Um, so that's stabilizing stuff. Is there any questions on this type of tuning stuff before, um, what time is it? Let's see. Quarter to nine. Quarter to nine. Why don't we take uh, 10 minutes after this, if there's no questions, before we go into some more advanced uh, equipment stuff that, I don't know, yeah, it might make people crazy, but we're going to play with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay.